everyone, and welcome to today's session. Uh, could be good morning if you're out there on the East Coast or for our friends out in the Hawaiian Islands, a very early good morning. <laughs> My name is Lisa Lozano and I am a productivity coach with Century 21 University. And I wanna welcome you to week three, day 11 of Celebrate 21. Hopefully you've been able to participate in all of our amazing sessions. If not, don't forget they are being recorded and you can go to the event website and play back those sessions as many times as you want. But again, that's for a limited time. So make sure you uh, take advantage of that. Today's session, our top producer session is growing with no growing pains, building your business with teams. We have an amazing uh, group with us today from all across the United States and also <clears throat> not to just location, but also the size of their teams. We really wanted to bring you a variety depending on where you are in your business and what you're considering to take things to the next level. So Matt and Shannon and Tina have some wonderful information to share with you and always willing to answer your questions. Don't forget to take advantage of that chat box. Um, throughout the session, we will be sharing or asking those questions. Um, but we may save those till the end, but please feel free to ask away. They are here for you. We are here for you. And I'm going to go ahead and let them introduce themselves because those are the folks that you're here to see today. So Matt, why don't we start with you and, and, and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Thanks so much, Lisa. My, uh, my name is Matt Weibel. I'm the team leader of the Matt Weibel team of Century 21 New Millennium. We're here in Severna Park, Maryland. And uh, I've been with Century 21 for just over two years, been in the business for 12. And um, something that I always kind of start off introducing myself, I'm actually a fourth generation realtor. So my great granddad opened up a brokerage uh, 70 years ago next month. Fantastic. We're really looking to hear from you today, Matt. Shannon? Hi, I'm Shannon Mangin, and I work on a team of two. So just my husband, Tyler, and I, um, this is my fifth year in the business full-time. And my husband just joined me at the beginning of 2020 last year. Um, and then prior to that, I was a former classroom teacher and then instructional coach for many years. And then my husband previously was a software engineer. Um, so it's, it's been a fun career change and we're loving it so far. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And Tina. Aloha, everybody. So my name is Tina and I'm originally from Texas. I've been in Hawaii coming up on a decade and I got into real estate on my 25th birthday in October and I just recently turned 29 in October. So I've been in the business that amount of time and I started my team a year ago and at this point point. I love it. It's small. We have a transaction coordinator and two other agents right now. And I really like the small size too. Very good. Uh, you know, one of the reasons we always like to do a panel on teams is because it is something of great interest to so many people, whether they're currently in a team and needing to take business to the next level, or maybe it's just an individual realtor who is really wondering how they're going to keep up with things right without being overwhelmed and or not even just overwhelmed with the amount of business or the uh, activities that need to take place to maintain that business but maybe it's an act you know something that they're not great at or something that they're not as passionate about and so as you're building your team and I think Matt you have done a really great job since you do tend to have that larger team out there is really building such a diverse group of talent, but want to just start out with each one of you taking a deeper dive into drawing us that picture of what your team currently looks like and how many transactions that you handle together annually. And Shannon, I'll start with you. Uh, I think there's a lot of agents out there who are just running their business solo right now and really wanting to, you know, is it the right time to start developing a team? So why don't you go ahead and, and share that information with us? Um, so as I mentioned, it's just my husband, um, Tyler, and I. Um, 
2020 was an interesting year <laughs> with everything that happened. And, and it was like, he just quit his job. And then a month later, it's like shelter in place. And I was like, oh my gosh, what have we done? Um, but we ended up having a very successful year. We did a total of 30 transactions, a little over 10 million. Um, our goal for this year, now that we've kind of got systems and things in place and, um, you know, we're off to a better start, we're trying to double that. So our goal is to try to do at least 50 transactions, 20 million in volume. And we are on track right now to hit that number. Um, I think long term, we would like to eventually hire either a transaction coordinator, maybe at the end of this year, possibly a buyer's agent. But um, right now, I feel like we have good flow on just the two of us being able to handle what we have. And with the two of you, I know that you have divided some of your responsibilities based on who's better at doing what. So what does that look like for you and your husband? So I, um, I've, I've kind of taken the lead with listings. I consider myself more of the listing um, agent and he works more with the buyer side, although we are trying to shift him over to get more comfortable doing listings on his own because we're really trying to get more inventory right now. Um, but I take the role with sellers. I also enjoy social media. He's not big on it. So I kind of take the lead with doing video. I run all of our social media um, pages and mostly focusing on Instagram. And um, he does more cold calling, which is something I don't really <laughs> enjoy doing, but he's good at it. And he'll just sit down with the dialer and just roll through numbers. And he is great at that. So he can book appointments for me. And then, you know, through social media, I've been getting us more referrals. And so we just kind of divvied it up so far that way. Nice. Very good. Yeah. And definitely seems to be working for the two of you. Great. Tina, draw us a picture of your team. Well, sorry. I gave a little bit about that. In my intro <laughs> That's okay. You're just over <laughs> overexcited. I love it. I am very excited. So <laughs> there's four of us. Uh, it's all ladies actually. So I've got Marissa, who's a transaction coordinator, and she's been with me the longest. And then I've got Anya and Sarah. And um, so our team started about a year ago, and actually Sarah just got licensed this year. So she's really brand new. Marissa's been with me for a couple of years. And last year, um, Anya joined me around February, and that's when I started to build the team. And last year with Anya and I, uh, you know, we did 63 transactions and 35 million. Um, so our goal this year is maybe about 100 transactions, but 50 to 60 million. And that's just with us four. Uh, so it's a lot of work, uh, but I definitely love it. So <laughs> that's exciting. And, um, you know, a lot of us, uh, you know, I'm not married, but I have a long-term boyfriend who was in the military and then the rest of the team are military spouses. And my business is, you know, 95% military working with the VA loan in the areas near bases. So it works out great because, you know, military have to move a lot. And the ladies on my team have experienced what our clients are going through when they first get here. And we're, we try to really be patient and understanding and guide people in the right direction. So it's, it's really awesome. Very nice. Now with your team, you said you mentioned the transaction coordinator and then for the, the other three of you, are you primarily kind of building your, each of your own businesses or do you do different things for the business itself? How does that work? So I would be the lead agent because I've, I guess, have the more experience. And then uh, Anya, um, she actually only did one transaction before joining my team in her whole first year of real estate. And then last year she did, I believe, 18 transactions. So that was really incredible, um, you know, mentoring her and seeing the growth in her for sure. Uh, we want to be well-rounded because a little fun fact about me is I'm an MMA fighter. And so uh, I like to travel for training. Um, my boyfriend also is a fighter as well. So he's got to travel for fights, especially now with COVID, not much is happening on the West Coast. So we've got to go to the East Coast. And so what really inspired me to want to build my team uh, was I wanted ladies or anybody that could resemble how I treat my clients when I can't be there at all times. So instead of having a specific buyer's agent or listing agents, I wanted to have uh, just overall a team that I can count on to present the same level of customer service that I present. 
I love that. You know, the Century 21 culture is all about providing extraordinary experiences, right? Yeah. Very good. Well, thank you. Matt, you have a, a, a pretty awesome structure to your team, and I would love for you to, to share that with our group today. Sure. Um, so one thing that I think everybody who's thinking about building a team or growing their team further uh, needs to realize is that a lot of times it starts off organically, just as Shannon and Tina's team did, whether it's a spouse, whether it's friends, whether it's people in the same same lifestyle, right? So you have military spouses who all kind of get together to pull up their talent. My story is not much different. I realized that my strength was out in the field and I needed somebody to kind of cover the back of my office. So it started off as an assistant, then became a, a team coordinator before I had really a team. And my whole idea was not too far different from Tina's. How do you be in four places at once? You can't. So as your book of business grows, I needed to find people to fill those spots. So multiple open houses, multiple showing tours. And once I got people who I trusted, they were mostly dual career. So we didn't have to worry about benefits. We didn't have to worry about financial. It was all side hustle. And I kind of had this eureka moment where most of my 25 teammates, I was doing the math in my head this morning, there's 12 of us that are full-time and, and 13 of us that it's a side hustle dual career. So when I say there's 25 teammates, the first thought is, wow, that's a pretty large team. <laughs> but in terms of like the core people who rely on real estate to pay their bills, the number is much less. And, and I use that as a point of distinction. Um, last year we did 213 sides and uh, 92 million total average sales price rate around 400 to 500 here. Um, but as we continue to grow our team, it's with that same organic mindset, finding people from other brokerages that maybe struggled their first or second year and kind of helping build their training up to get them to where they need to be. But for, for my team, you know, sometimes I we're, had a little event outside on Friday and I joked with one of my teammates who's been with me the longest, I was like, how did we get to 25 people? It wasn't like a, a set plan, but as awesome opportunities arose and we found really good people to fill different roles or for us it's different languages. So we're a quintilingual team. Um, in addition to English, we have native speaking Spanish, French and Korean teammates. And then Joe Smith, uh, who is not deaf, but was born into a deaf household is our sign language interpreter. So in addition to doing 17 to 18 million dollars last year himself, he also runs one of the largest sign language interpreting businesses in Maryland. So what we've found is that if you find people who have unique SOIs and can, can get into appointments that the rest of us can't get into, um, also and collectively we have this ability to grow our business much faster than if we did it individually. I love that. And I think that you also mentioned too on, you know, some of the things that you've been able to focus on with your team members as you're bringing them on is not only the differences in speaking of languages, but also in their talents and skills and not necessarily just looking for that person that has a history in real estate. The, yeah, I'd say the biggest thing that has kind of changed in the last couple of years, especially since we came over to Century 21, we have, um, you know, a partnership and a, and a vision of where the team is heading with our, our brokerage that's a little different than it was at our last place. And it's given us room to grow and, and kind of take advantage of, of opportunities. But our team as a whole is organic based. So out of that 92 million that we did last year, 85 of it was organic SOI business. So our target for this year seems drastic increase was 125 million. And it's because we have teammates who joined us two or three years ago who are just now starting to come into their own and they can do so without like a pedal to the metal or full throttle mentality because they have income coming from a spouse or a dual career. And it allows them to build their business the right way, which then allows them to have recurrent business, hopefully for decades to come. 
Very good. And and now you're I hear you mentioning a lot on SOI. And for our folks who are tuning in right now, Matt is running our agent session tomorrow all about SOI. So if you're interested in hearing more about what he has um, to say on that subject matter, please make sure that you tune in for that. Okay, well, let's go on to our next question. Um, Shannon, you know, a lot of agents move into that role of team leader because they're motivated, whether it's time, resources, or financial gain. So what was it for you uh, that kind of got you a little bit more motivated to, to move into this team structure with your husband? Um, for us, it was both just trying to find more of like a work-life balance. Um, my career in real estate had gotten busy enough that I felt like I couldn't handle it. And I saw that I was losing business, you know, kind of slipping away. Um, one weekend I had like four new listings and every owner wanted me personally to do the open house that Sunday. And I'm, and I'm like, I, I can't. So um, I started relying on other agents in my office to try to get them to host open houses for me. Um, and I know I lost a lot of, you know, potential buyer leads and everything just because I could not physically be in all these different places at once. And so I started brainstorming, like, how can I get a buyer's agent or someone else helping me, a partner on my team? And then at the same time, my husband was in a career where he was just feeling completely burned out. He had been a web designer, software engineer for many, many years. And it's a, it was a, um, just a career where he was feeling very unappreciated and overworked. And, you know, their, their thoughts were, well, you can work nights, weekends, we'll pay you. You can just sit home and code, but he was just miserable. And he's like, I don't want to work 60 hours a week. I want to be able to take, take it down. So we were both complaining kind of about the same thing. And we just really started brainstorming. Okay. What if you quit and you join me and we did this together and, and it, you took months. It wasn't just something that we you know, jumped into blindly, but it took a long time of just kind of planning, looking at numbers, how much would we have to make to make this shift. Um, but it was a huge relief to him. Like he has no thoughts of going back and, and looking backwards on it and um, no regrets. Like I said, it was a, it was a kind of a scary leap of faith to leave something that you've done for 25 years and having that steady paycheck. Uh, but we definitely are seeing a better quality of life. And even if we're working, a lot of times we're working together and it's fun, you know, we're out working with clients, but then we'll make a day trip and we're out in the Texas Hill country. So we showed people out in, uh, uh, Spicewood and Marble Falls, these little towns. And afterwards we're like, let's check out a winery, just the <laughs> two of us. And so it felt like, you know, we're having fun, even though we worked and that's what we were really wanting is just you know, where we are with each other more and, and can enjoy our time. And I think you talk about stepping out of a 25 year career that was comfortable. And as Matt was just mentioning with a lot of his team folks, they do have a dual career because of just even the, the resource of having some benefits. So, and I know you guys have a, a lot of great fun together. If you're not following our folks on social media, you definitely want to, to look them up. Tina, how about you? What was your motivation? So my motivation is kind of what we all touched base a little bit on is we can't be everywhere at once. And so um, for me, it was traveling to Colorado for my MMA training and of course, a lot of things in this industry can be done virtually, well, especially now after a global pandemic, we've learned that. Um, but for me, I needed help with showings, uh, just, you know, and I wanted showings to be done a certain way. Like I wanted people to have the same level of genuine care that I have for clients instead of just asking an agent, you know, in group chat or something, if somebody can help cover down on showings why I'm not in the state. And I'm in a completely different time zone as well. So for me, it was time uh, was my main factor in wanting to grow and build a team. So that way I could uh, service all my clients. Because I just, I generally really care about people. And I wanted to make sure that if I was going to let my client be with another agent, that I knew exactly how this agent would be performing and that they'd have the same level of care that I have as to answering all of their questions and really being available for them. So I found the best way to do that is to have a team with set expectations of everybody on the team. Great, yeah, I think it just goes back to maintaining that high level of customer service. That's gotta be the hardest part. So Matt, um, when you went from solo agent 
to a team leader? Was it scary? Was it intimidating? You know, if so, why? But even more, most importantly, is how do you know? How did you know that you were ready? How did you know it was time to make this move? To echo a little bit of, of both the ladies' sentiments, it was mostly out of uh, out of need. Like as your book of business grows to a point where you can't keep up with it. Uh, for me personally, it was looking back at how I treated some of my first clients and I was selling myself as the young guy who was always available and ready to jump in and get the job done to all of a sudden it's like, <laughs> which, which way can I go and how can I keep everybody happy? And the answer is you can't. So you have to come up with a system or create a, a expectations for clients. So for me, as I, I took the leap, First and foremost, it was based off of production. I had written out a business plan from 2010 to 2025 of everything I wanted to do. And based off of the marketplace in which I compete, what do other people that are doing $10 million a year have? Well, they all have an assistant. As soon as I hit 10 million assistant, hey, when someone does $25 million a year, what do they have? They have a little small team, done. Uh, when someone does 100 million a year, they have their own office, got it. So little things like that, I think you can use from a old school business planning of, of like a target. But truly, I think one thing to touch on in addition to the additional time you get back, hopefully for family or friends or, or both, it's the, the whole idea for me was to be able to provide that same level of customer service, but then to take it a step further and say, whoa, I can find people who are better at other things than I am and now the customer service level just went up another level. So for us, um, you know, we have all the admin work for anyone on our team is off their plate. So we have a full-time person to write contracts. We have a full-time director of marketing. We have a listing coordinator that handles the listing from the time you say, hey, I have a new listing that, uh, signed to the time it goes on the market. We have somebody that takes all that off your plate. So if you're a dual career or you're full-time like me, you go out and do what you do best, which is hopefully get more, more listings and more buyers. And right now, more listings. <laughs> I know. Shannon just mentioned four listings in one week. And I'm like, wow, wouldn't we all just die for that right now? <laughs> we, have a, we have a funny little saying right now. It looks like a math equation. It says listings greater than buyers. <laughs> That's true. the 2021 20, motto. Pretty much everywhere across the United States, you know, when I'm online doing some sort of teaching, I always ask about that. And sure enough, it's uh, definitely a shortage on listings out there. Oh, I was just going to ask you something. It'll probably come. Oh, what I really, I keep kind of touching on is the fact that you have, you're building your team on strengths of people because it's really interesting in our industry, the majority, and I'm going to say not everybody, but the majority of realtors are not the greatest or don't have a passion for the administrative side of things. I was the same way. I just, it was something that I just did not like to do. And so the fact there are people out there that that's just, that's what they love to do. They be, like to be able to sit and organize. And, and so to have somebody to help do that with your database with a follow-up or to make sure that everything's happening in a timely manner, to have those people that it's their strengths and something that they're more passionate about, I think is a great way. Um, and I love that you have focused on that. Well, the, the one thing that I found with the back end support is don't necessarily have to go outside the industry. Do you have a really good title processor that you work with a ton and they're burned out of the title industry? They already know how to manage dozens and dozens of files at a time. So my vice president who runs the entire team, honestly, I, I like to joke that I'm just a team leader. She runs it. Um, <laughs> but she had 20 years in title before she joined and got a real estate license. And she walked in and uh, said, hey, your back office systems are terrible. <laughs> and and I, I said, whoa, they're your back office systems. They're terrible. And she goes, what do you mean? I said, carte blanche, you have, you have unlimited reign to do whatever you want. So when you find a true partner like that, that can take the stuff that you're not good at, off her plate. But in return, the joke back is if I made her go sit in a listing appointment or sit on this Zoom, no thank you. That's not her cup of tea. So it's kind of fun when you find somebody who's like the perfect balance. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Shannon, I know you've um, kind of gone back and forth a little bit about how your team developed. So if you have anything more on that to share, but you know, again, going back to 
you know, was it a matter of how did you know you were ready or when was those things? It's just where life was taking you down that path. Um, like I said, it was, it was kind of like Matt said a need. I mean, it was just, my husband's job was so miserable. <laughs> it, was, it was making us both miserable just because of so much pressure and demand and stress on him that we were really seriously planning it. Um, but he is also very analytical. He's an engineer. So we, he made spreadsheets and we literally looked at all of our budget because he was giving up a six figure salary with health insurance and everything. And so we researched, okay, what would it cost for us to get health insurance? What would it cost? What does it take for me to run my business? Which I think most agents don't even know, like how much are you spending on all these different categories? our food. I mean, we went through our whole budget and planned everything out. And then it's like, okay, I'm not making this income anymore. How many houses do we need? So then we looked at like exactly what do I net per transaction? And we kind of came up with a number and was like, okay, if I can just get 10 more transactions, we can be okay. If I can get, you know, 15, 20, we can actually have some fun. (laughs) You know, we can go on a vacation or something. We just needed 10 just to be like, we can do this. And, you know, I figured with the help of him joining that it wasn't that crazy out of reach. And um, like I said, so we, but we put a lot of planning into it. Um, Both of us are big planners and it wasn't something that we just like blindly quit and just, oh, we're going to do this for fun. It was, you know, it took a lot of forethought to make sure that was a good move. But now, so that's on the financial side of things, but yeah. when, when you were looking at a small team and just getting started and for you, yeah. it was your husband, or maybe for somebody else out there, it's going to be somebody that they are partnering up with in their office, or maybe another family member or friend. So when you talk about scary, I mean, or, or intimidating, how was that with thinking about how is this going to work with the relationship being different now? Are we going to be able to work together? Are we going to be able to make it happen? We get along very well, which is good. Um, I would say my advice is also you need boundaries sometimes though, because um, just to say like, we are not talking about work, (laughs) you know, because it's so easy. Um, And sometimes you're excited because you're happy. I mean, you're running a business. It can be fun. And, but sometimes it's like, you're, you know, at breakfast, you're talking about work and then you're talking about this and you're talking about that and at dinner, then you're talking about work. So you kind of lose that separation. So we have to remind ourselves, why did we quit our jobs in the first place? Cause we wanted work-life balance. So there is, it is very important that you at least plan um, some time off on whatever day, if you have a slow day, even a half day dinner or something, but just say, we are going to go out together. Do not take appointments. Don't do this and just block out time for yourselves. Um, where it's a separation where there's, you know, it's not okay to talk about real estate <laughs> during those few hours just because you do need that balance there. Yeah. I like the fact that you said set boundaries. That's fantastic. And yeah. Tina, what about you? How did, was it, was it a little scary for you because now you're supporting other, not so necessarily supporting completely financially, but and what were your thoughts on that? So absolutely. It was scary uh, for me. Uh, I'm competitive as the MMA fighter in me comes out. And so um, I just have this hustle and hard work side of me. And at the end of the day, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. So I had a lot of learning curves because as mentioned previously, I started a team a year ago. And so I had a lot of learning curves in realizing that I can provide all the tools and resources kind of like Century 21 does. Century 21 has an abundance of tools and resources, but they don't mean anything unless we utilize them. So I can provide as many training courses and shadowing opportunities as possible. However, if they're not retaining the information and actually applying it, then it doesn't mean as much. So I think, um, you know, the nerve wracking part is having the right team members that want to take the opportunity that you're presenting them with and run with it. And that is such a such a blessing to have that now. Very good. I love it. Absolutely. So what I want to do is, you guys, if you don't mind, I'm going to kind of step off of our, our list of questions that, and just take one that we have here in the chat box, because I think this is something that a lot of people really have at the top of their mind when they are considering beginning a team. And so Matt, we'll start with you. But the question is, how do you set up pay structure for your teams? You know, is it different? You know, your buyer's agent, transaction coordinator, um, do you provide bonuses? Are you the listing agent for all transactions? So Matt, do you want to answer that question first? 
Sure. Um, I'm going to go back and answer a question that I skipped over. I just looked back up the list and wanted to make sure it's a great segue into this. If you're thinking about starting a team purely for financial gain or that you're going to get rich off of having dozens of agents out there selling and buying real estate for you, I'm here to tell you that that is only this much of the equation. And if you approach it that way, the people that you get to join your team are going to find that out very quickly, be turned off and leave. Um, we, look, we approach our team as truly like a work family. And it's not just in the picking up real estate related tasks to help each other out. I truly believe that first and foremost, people join the team so that they can have a little bit semblance of that work-life balance and knowing that they can't do it by themselves in this crazy industry. Um, my goal at the beginning of every year is what I pay out, I basically break even. And then if there's some years where I'll have some profit, there's some years that I don't. But keep in mind that is including me paying for admin staff. So if I was to pay for admin staff out of my pocket, that would be something that I would have to pay. So I look at that as if you can break even and go out and do your own book of business. Last year I did somewhere around 32 million myself and have this back end support, then it kind of runs itself. So when I started the team, I basically operated off of the brokers at that time split level and basically said any organic SOI business you bring in, I don't want to take any of your money, but if we run it through my business, we'll, we'll basically live off the Delta between the two splits. So if someone walks in at X and my split is Y, I live off the Y and build the admin staff around what that builds out. Uh, as the team has grown, I've kept that mentality um, I pay people out a little bit actually better than what they would start off the street. But the idea is that they maybe stay in those areas longer in terms of how they work their way up the ladder. Um, in terms of paying people, I have no employees. Every single person's 1099 and they have an agreement with the brokerage and myself. Uh, our team agreement actually just got revised and, and signed uh, last month. It's now like 25 pages. I am also a detail oriented person and laid out literally my expectations for every person on the team from admin staff to listing agents to buyers agents. But everybody I bring on the team is encouraged to grow their own book of business and not pigeonhole themselves. So if they want to come in and only do listings, that's fine. But what are you going to do with your buyers? Hey, Matt, I only want to help you with buyers because I only have four or five days a week to do real estate. Okay, fine. What are we going to do with our listings? Because what I don't want anyone to do is lose a potential lead because their SOI only knows them to do X. So we, for those people, provide them immediate business planning services so that when we sit down and do it, there's no real gaps in their business. But to answer the, the, the question about the transaction coordinators and stuff like that, everyone gets paid off the top percentage based and we have every single person line item based off of what their level is within the team. So the higher the level, the less admin split there is. The lower the level, the more admin split. And one thing when I meant, didn't mention earlier about setting up my team, we've grown so rapidly uh, to a point where I feel that the perfect team size is 10 two admins for 10 people that are out working. So as we grew to 25 like that, we actually split our team up into sub teams called pods. Each one of these pods has five to six agents that has one top producing agent from the team that oversees what they do. And then each of them is working on getting their own assistant. So that way the level of service within that little pod can operate kind of like our team did four or five years ago but then that frees me up to be everyone's mentor rather than being down in the weeds. Very good. And did you mention, um, are you the listing agent, the first agent for all listings that come through or does that go so to? The really cool thing, uh, myself and two other large team leaders a couple of years ago wrote to our local MLS and got them to add a co-buyer's agent as well. There's always been a co-listing agent so we have everything run under the team number, which is mine, but then anyone that does business themselves gets under the co-agent and that solved a huge riddle because if you look up any of my teammates, 
it shows an active portrayal of what they do for themselves. And if you look me up, it shows what the team does. So it doesn't hurt them. And that's one thing, it's not really on the questions, but as, as you recruit talent or you grow talent, one of the toughest things for all of us is to retain that talent. And that was a huge headache that we got to avoid because we wanted them to get individual credit for as they grow. And that's something that your local MLS provides. So everyone may want to look into that and see if that's offered through their local association. Great. Uh, Tina, I'm going to go next to you since you have a team of four. Okay. Um, so for me, um, you know, I did put, put a little question there. Before we go off me, can I ask Matt that question that I typed up? Oh, yeah. Sorry, I, I missed it. No, you're fine. So, okay. When you say what your team does as far as, um, you know, co-buyer, they get the MLS credit. Are you saying that they get the credit when they bring in the lead or, cause I'm sure, you know, with all your admin that you mentioned that you're paying for, um, do they get credit for any lead they work or only the leads that they bring in? So they get paid out at their full split. If it's their own SOI, if it's a referral from me, another teammate, the company, the broker, everything has a, in that detailed paperwork has a split percentage. Um, if you work the deal, I get them the credit though. So that way they can, I'm all about momentum marketing. So if you're posting a picture on Instagram and it shows you selling this house, but then it doesn't show up on your Zillow profile, how can you build that momentum? Yeah. So for me, uh, the payout behind the scenes, which Instagram world, Facebook world, it's none of their business, right? But on the front end of showing off your client, you know, the best part is you don't have to sit there and say, hey, look at my Relo buyer that I just paid 50% referral for. You don't have to do that. It's like, look at my buyer that I just helped buy this $600,000 house. That then leads to maybe two or three more SOI deals. So yeah, it's, it's based off of who, whoever generates the business obviously gets paid the most. But um, I've been, again, since the beginning, trying to build it the way I would want it to be run if I was a member of the team, I get paid out the same way um, based off of my production. So it's it's completely transparent for the team. Everybody knows what everybody's getting paid and it, there's really no secrets, which I find leads to no real animosity, no jealousy. And if everybody's playing by the same rules, there's no way they can say like, hey, this wasn't fair. Definitely. I'm learning so much from you, Matt. Thank you for <laughs> I really enjoy all this for sure. I mean, this is incredible. Thank you for this opportunity that you've given us all, Lisa. Um, so what is my question that you'd like to ask? Well, really quick, I just want to make sure, um, Matt, did you happen to mention the whole, do you do any type of bonus seeing if somebody, do you have a, a goal that you set up initially at the beginning of the year and if, or any type of bonus structure? Uh, bonuses, no, the bonus is built in so they could get a higher split and then we only roll back one level. Okay. So if you crush 2021 and go from being a $2 million to say $8 million agent, you don't have to climb up the same ladder. So this, the, the bonus is the rest of this year, you're paid out at this, you roll back 5% and that's your level moving forward. So if someone goes up two levels, they'll be getting paid out 10% more per deal than they were a year ago. So the bonus is, I'm a big new money guy. And if any of my teammates are watching, they'll laugh at that because it's literally what I talk about all the time. You only get paid on this team if you produce. So the admins are only getting a paycheck based off of settlements. I'm only getting a paycheck if I sell. One of the things I think people do, and it, it comes to a detriment, is if you hire an admin who is getting paid every two weeks, regardless of production, they're not gonna have the same level of motivation or buy-in. So I'd rather overpay someone on new money, then underpay them on old money because their motivation to help me get new money will be this, zero. And someone can be like, oh, I'm motivated, I'm a team player. But unless, as the, the, all of us on this chat know and anyone who's following along, I like to say, when you're crushing it in real estate, you're floating up in the clouds. And it isn't until you run out of deals when you look down from the clouds and realize how far the fall could possibly be. If you are the only person on your team that has that potential for a fall, you are setting yourself up for it. 
where if you're all in it together, you'll come up with a solution to make sure we all don't go down. So that abyss is one of the things that I like to say keeps me motivated to keep my wings flapping, you know? I love that, right? Rise together and fall together. Great. So Tina, the question um, that came through the chat box is, how do you set up your pay structure for your teams? Uh, buyers, agents, um, your transaction coordinator, do you provide bonuses and are you the listing agent for all transactions? So I believe generosity drives loyalty. So for me, um, I read a book called The Go-Giver and I just have naturally been a generous person. Um, you know, I, I think my love language can be giving gifts. And so if it's pop bites to clients or uh, flowers or whatever, um, same with my team, because as Matt was saying, it's like a big family. So for me, um, do I give bonuses? I told the girls uh, we're, we're supposed to hit 50 million is our low end for the year. So I told the girls that if we can uh, stay on track in the first quarter, I would take them and we'd go, I'd buy each of them a pair of red bottoms. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I, we all know each other pretty well. And so I'm like, okay, it's driving them to go out and get a nice bougie item. So, uh, and it's exciting because then it's something that we're all doing together. So I feel like what Matt was saying, you know, we look, um, we look at that fall and we're all like, okay, what's our goal? How are we going to hit this? How can we all hold each other accountable? Um, you know, and what can we do to improve things like that? Another thing is my transaction coordinator was also doing a lot of assistant work for me. And I noticed uh, about a year ago in a couple months, oh no, about two years ago, um, she was just getting really busy and, uh, you know, she wasn't able to fulfill all the assistant duties that I was needing at the time because my business was growing. I went from, before joining Century 21 Island Homes with Aaron Evans, I went from selling 10 million. And then the very next year after I started getting mentored by Aaron Evans, um, I sold 25 million all on my own. And that was just two years ago. And in that year, I was noticing a lot of growth. And so I realized that my transaction coordinator, Marissa, was doing assistant work, but the assistant work wasn't getting handled. So I hired her an assistant. <laughs> and so that really helped her out a lot because then she could delegate out work that she knew that I needed, um, but I didn't necessarily have to hire and train the assistant. I mean, I hired her and paid her, but she did the overflow of work that Marissa was essentially too busy to do. And so I, I provide bonuses just along the way. Um, Ergie was in high school at the time and the job was flexible and she would describe the position as the best job ever because we'd, we'd do nice things. Like we've had, um, you know, spa days where we all just, you know, get facials together. We go to nice breakfast, lunch, or dinners. Um, you know, last weekend we went to Maui <laughs> for showing houses, but it was fun along the way. So, you know, we try to keep it, you know, the family oriented and do fun things together. And then I'm paying for those. So essentially, I guess that would be something that we'd call bonuses. And then um, transaction coordinator, I really, uh, you know, rely heavily on my transaction coordinator, Marissa, to stay on top of things and give me a good update daily uh, on top of my Google calendar. If things are due, I have everything in there. Uh, but for her, I, I pay her a generous amount, I would say. And then I know I pay her more than most people on the island would pay their TCs. And am I the listing agent for all transactions? At this point, I, I am, but I have, uh, you know, as mentioned previously, a year ago is when I built my team and it was Anya had only sold one before and Sarah's newly licensed. So I would say I have the most experience hardly, you know, I mean, maybe in transactions, but not that many years. And so, uh, but I don't want to only be the listing agent. So I have a couple of listings working right now where I'm CCing the girls, I'm bringing them on, like, you know, I'm making sure at least one of them comes to every appointment with me. I like to introduce, uh, you know, to clients that, hey, there's four of us, you're going to get to know at least three of us because one of them is the transaction coordinator and then you have two agents. So there's only one agent that they're not really needing throughout the whole process. And for them, um, we do group chats, things like that to stay organized. So if I can't answer a question fast enough, um, somebody else can, things like that. So 
Uh, you know, the more that they are contributing with group chats and talking, uh, the more money they're going to make on that transaction. Nice. And I, <clears throat> I just think because your team is so new and you're fairly new to the real estate industry as well, that your, your team is just starting to evolve and taking what you're learning from each other and moving forward. So that's great. Now, Shannon, for you, <laughs> your pity structure is probably a little bit different between you and your husband. Does your husband get bonuses? <laughs> I get everything. No, I, I just, we, we just divvy it up depending on, you know, who gets the lead. Like I want him to develop his reputation on his own because eventually I would love people to be like, Oh, I want to work with Tyler and do listings and stuff with him. So we don't put everything in my name. Um, and what helps is just because there are two of us, I think it definitely helps with building rapport with people. And I think, um, you know, clients take us more seriously because they know there's so many part-time agents um, out there and they know like both of us, this is our full-time career. So they know that we're heavily devoted to getting their home sold or helping them purchase it. And we usually will try to meet people, you know, the first time and do a Zoom conference or something. So they see both of us. One of us may take the lead depending on who we think is a better match, you know, for the transaction. Um, but if something happens like today, I'm doing this right here. And, uh, I have a client that needed to see an offer and because things are moving so quickly, Tyler is down there right now working with her. She's technically my client, but she knows who Tyler is, you know, she's met him before. And so he's down there working that lead for me. So we just, you know, we can kind of cover our bases, but we at least present ourselves as, you know, we're, you're hiring a team. There's two of us working. One of us will always be available for you. Very nice. Yep. Keep those questions coming in the chat box, everybody. I love hearing what, um, what questions that you have. So we make sure that we answer those during our session today. So the next question that I have for you, Matt, is, um, you know, as you're, you were developing your team, you're, you're creating, you know, you're doing all your homework and everything, but you're also creating this vision of what you want it to look like. So, you know, did you have that vision in the beginning? What was it? Or even as you're moving forward and things are starting to evolve with each of your teams, what is the vision that you have for it going forward? At some point, are you going to want to, you know, pull it back, kind of hold off on things, continue to grow? You just, you know, you said earlier, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe we have 25 people on our team. So talk to us about your vision so i i often joke that i'm the the big picture guy uh and, and the team helps me get there so much faster because we have people that take the vision and, and do the things whether it's marketing whether it's admin whether it's the listing whether it's the contracts um what i'm most excited about is not necessarily taking a huge jump up in number of new teammates unless the opportunity provides itself what I'm looking forward to is we have a lot of people who are on the cusp of becoming what I consider producers. So around here, um, I, I use the cutoff of $2 million a year. Anyone that does less than 2 million, which let's call it six, seven transactions a year. Anyone that does less than that, I call a hobbyist. And that's not like a diss. It's just, we have, as Shannon said, a ton of part-time people, people know they're part-time. They pick up most of their business off of cold leads and they grind and they do six or seven transactions, but there's no way that that person has the same level of, of experience or customer service to be able to do what someone that's doing call it 20, 25, especially in a marketplace like this. So what we, I kicked off this year with a, a speech to the team called be your own CEO. And, and that kind of goes to the vision of what my team is, where it's headed. Um, basically, everyone on the team has two years to get above that level of hobbyist into producer. And producer level is for us is gonna be somewhere between three and seven or eight million. And as long as, long as you're doing three to eight million a year, you stay on as a full-time producer. Above eight, let's call it eight to 20, you're a legit, big time agent. We have, we have two additional teammates to, in addition to me, that's in that level. And then above that, you're kind of, you know, a known entity. So our vision for the team is to get everyone who wants to commit into that producer or, or top producing agent and anyone who wants to stay on the team, stay licensed and Hey Matt, I'm just here to, to fund a, a boat or fund college or fund whatever. 
you'll always have a place on this team, but they're going to become what's called a brand ambassador. And brand ambassadors on our team are going to be allowed, allowed to show homes, sit open houses, do everything a normal agent will, but they can't be the point person. They can't be the point person advising what to offer or what to list it for. They're going to have to hand that off to one of the producers. So as we grow and maybe add a fifth pod, each pod is going to have some brand ambassadors that refer business internally to that pod. Each pod is going to have that mentor who's crushing it, you know, 15 plus million dollars a year, kind of the rainmaker of that little pod. And then the entire team collectively, our goal is to have each pod do between 25 and 30 million. So if we have five pods doing 25 to 30, our sweet spot's going to be right about 125 to 150. And at that, um, when you start going above, I'd say 300 units, I'm talking about probably having to double my admin staff. So the goal is to kind of keep it where if we add one or two more admin positions, you're not taking all the profits of all of a sudden doing 300 transactions and just giving them back away. It's find that sweet spot so that you're not just producing to produce and to be able to keep the product where, where we want it. So I love that. So it sounds like your brand ambassador is a step up from a referring agent where they are out there able to do some of those activities to generate those leads. But then, like you said, they hand it off to somebody within their pod. A hundred percent. So that is an option for people on the team to be a referral partner and they hang their license basically in that referral status. They don't have to pay dues. They don't have to do anything, they, but they can't be a member of the team. So they can refer business as a licensed referral agent, but they can't be a part of it. What I wanted to create was a position where somebody can still wear the logo. They can still host events. They can still you know, use our tents and use our stuff to go out and drive business, but I'm going to pay them out more on that referral fee than somebody who's in the referral. And then to Tina's, to Tina's point, uh, about bonuses. I love it. I, I didn't actually didn't think about that when you were talking about the events and the team only stuff that we do. I think it's the best way to build camaraderie, to have fun. And as everyone knows, this industry can burn you out pretty quick. And it's fun to kind of have those nights where we rent out a sailboat out of Annapolis. It's a gigantic schooner and the whole team and, and spouses are plus one to come. And it's, it's a fun night. And Uber required, let's just say. <laughs> um, and, then, and then one other thing too, um, we have some sales clubs. So anybody who hits 5 million gets a thing. Anyone who hits 10 million gets a thing. So as far as bonuses go, um, the people who did over 15 million and I are going out to Scottsdale when COVID allows, and we're going to do a plus one spouses trip. So Very nice. One more question back to the brand ambassadors. Now, do you ever, do they if they have a desire to go to that next level where they're actually a producing agent, do they, um, does the rest of the pod help mentor them? If, they, if there's an option there, they can shadow that, that type of thing. Are they there for that support? 110%, yeah. So it's not like a permanent decision. So for example, let's say somebody all of a sudden is expecting and they're like, we're not gonna hit the level and we're not gonna be able to maintain our staff status as a producing agent. That's not a permanent, you have to be a brand ambassador forever. It's a, hey, don't you think it makes sense while you might not be able to do this? Or if we had somebody who got a lot of uh, humongous promotion at their full-time gig, there's no way. So like life gets in the way, but it shouldn't kill your real estate career. So it's trying to come up with creative ways so that no one on the outside knows they're a brand ambassador. Right. You're not like advertising yourself as part-time agent here. Hey, everybody, use me. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, it's to give them the, the skill and the tools to be able to promote themselves as a full-time agent without maybe having the knowledge of someone who's grinding every day. Nice. Tina, what was your vision? And as things are evolving, how is that vision uh, evolving with it? So my vision for the team was um, a lot of it, as I've mentioned a lot previously, relies around the customer service. So I wanted all of our clients to be treated special. Um, I realized that in my first, uh, from going from before joining Aaron Evans at Century 21 Island Homes, um, I was, you know, staying in touch with, you know, the clients that maybe I bonded with really well. 
And however, I was losing touch with uh, some of the other clients. And I really didn't like that because I bonded with everybody just because I bonded a little bit more with somebody um, doesn't mean that I would, you know, should stay in touch with them more than the others. And so for me, now that I have assistance with showings and different, um, you know, activities in the real estate business, I'm able to go out to more dinners with clients. I'm able to take them to lunch. I'm able to take past clients to go get mani petties. I'm able to do my pop buys and stop by. I struggle because then I'm in their house talking for so long. So, um, you know, with these kind of activities, I think it's drawing more growth to the business. So for me, uh, my vision is just to keep providing, uh, you know, top-notch customer service. Like I, you know, when I have talked to some other agents about what I do when I was looking for, you know, assistance, uh, they were like, yeah, I bought a house and maybe it wasn't the best experience. And I tell them, well, I need an assistant to blow up balloons um, and tie it to champagne because at their home inspection, I give them balloons and champagne as a celebratory remark to say, hey, you got an acceptance, especially in this market. I've been doing it for years, but I'm like, you got an acceptance, like go celebrate tonight. I know you're hearing about some issues with your home inspection, but hey, here you go. And I've got somebody that goes and picks up the champagne. I've got somebody that blows up the balloons with our helium tank at the office. And I've got somebody that makes sure that we don't run out of balloons or helium at the office to where I just have to grab that bottle of champagne with balloons and go to the home inspection and be there to hold my client's hand. So my vision really relies on, you know, Century 21's vision of, you know, defying mediocrity and just going above and beyond for clients. So you know, defy, deliver, all of that, uh, you know, with the team, I'm able to produce that even more because I'm not running around doing all the back end things. Great. Um, <clears throat> I think I was mentioning it before our session began today, and I happened to have the opportunity to sit into our class that we had on Thursday with Gabe. And so with one of the things, as you're doing all these fantastic things to provide that extraordinary experience is, you know, are we sharing that out in our world of social media? Because that's where folks get to see you in your roles each and every day. And if you haven't had a chance, if you weren't able to sit in on that, you guys go back and watch the playback. It's, it's pretty impressive. And I know that one of the things, as I jump into Shannon's vision of you know, her team and maybe where she sees it moving forward. Uh, that's one area that she has been able to start to, to really do a lot in is through her social platforms. And so, you know, let's make sure that we're sharing those things out there. I love it. So Shannon, your vision as you were starting and, um, you know, we're as yours is starting to evolve with Tyler, what do you see in the future for your team? Um, as of right now, I enjoy having a small team. Like I said, I like that just the two of us for now, I don't have like mega plans of a, of a huge team at this point, but it could evolve. Um, maybe get, like I said, a transaction coordinator might be our next step into this year. Um, but going to the social media, like one of the things we did learn is, um, last year, I think we were desperate when things got hard, we're like, we'll take any lead. So even if it was kind of a little bit further away or whatever, we started working buyer leads and stuff. And we really started thinking about it more like we really want to be the experts in Lake Travis, which is kind of the west part of Austin, the hill country area, because we live about 40 minutes outside of Austin. So when we get a lead on the east side, that's like a two hour something round trip, it's kind of miserable <laughs> to drive, you know, it's a big drain on time and energy. And I, you know, we really started thinking like, who is our ideal client? And it's, it's homeowners, it's people who already live here because we need listings. We don't need, you know, everyone wants to move here we need more sellers. So we really would love to do like 75% listings, less buyers eventually get the buyer you know, agent to help. So I shifted all of our marketing really to make us more like the hill country experts and um, focusing all my videos and everything aimed at sellers. And it's definitely helped us um, to get into a higher price point to do less driving um, and I would love for us to be more recognizable in the area that we love. And that's why we live there, you know, and, and some of those little towns, that's kind of really our vision is to be that Lake Travis area expert, um, not just like anywhere in Austin, but just really defining our niche. And that's helped us a lot. Yeah. Great. Yes. You've done some fun things on social media. I, I love following you. 
Okay, Matt, so um, with your team, as you were starting, what are some of the, the things that you are able to additionally offer by having your team that you weren't able to as a, a solo agent? And I know some of the things that you talked about in the beginning of the session was the, I don't even know, I can't remember how you say, it's not bilingual, I know it was five, <laughs> but what are some of the other things that you can offer as a team? Um, well, first, I, uh, one comment on Shannon. I, I, um, I'm inspired that she can work with her spouse. My wife is my best friend, but we've often, often joked of her getting in industry and uh, thought of us both being this, this obsessed with real estate. I, I commend you for that. But uh, one thing I've been writing in my notes because I'm listening to both of you and writing stuff down, um, transaction coordinator, absolutely. But you might want to find a full-time person that doesn't want to steal your business, but that can you can offer somebody else time to get away. And conversely, if you ever to say, well, I need to get out of here for a weekend. That's the only thing that I've been writing down of like, oh my gosh, if, if you had to go away for a weekend, I don't want you to miss out on that business, you know? Um, my, the, the thing I tell every brand new agent or if they're with a different brokerage is everybody's been in this position when they started you are looking up at a mountain and in between you and that mountaintop are other agents, noise, people telling you you're too young or too new in the business, or I already have a realtor because they're my brother-in-law or sister-in-law or insert whatever. And it's like this boulder that you by yourself have to push up this hill. And for six, six and a half years, even with all the success that came early in my career, that boulder was still at like an angle like this. And what I think our teammates offer to, to new, what our team offers to new agents or people who have spent a year or two at another brokerage with little to no success is, I feel like that mountaintop is more like here. You still have to want it. And to Tina's point earlier, like I can take the horse to water. I can't force it to drink. So if they don't want to be their own CEO, there's still a boulder to push up, but instantaneously, they are able to walk into an appointment, have their mentor or me help close that deal. So you get me in a listing appointment, especially Zoom has been a godsend, by the way, to be able to do listing and buyer appointments via Zoom. I can do a lot more of them than driving around. <clears throat> 15,000 less miles on my car in 2020 than 2019, to give you an example of how much less driving. But as you go in to help close these deals, back, back on the market, uh, momentum marketing, if they get three listings this month, and when I first started my career, I'd love to say I would have gotten three for three, maybe one out of three. So that's only one sign. That's only one open house. That's only one house on the postcard. Where for these people, if we can crush all three and someone joins my team from a different brokerage and in the first month, they're sending out a postcard that says first month with the Matt Weibel team, boom, two for sale and one sold. Their SOI is like, what in the world just happened to this person? And then it's three solds and then it's three more solds and then it's three more solds. So they don't have to get over that same hump of convincing their SOI that, yeah, don't run from it. Don't lie. Hey, how long have you been in the business? My joke is I'm still blowing the ink dry on my license here. Hold on. I'm good to list my house with you. But if you can say, hey, look, I am brand new, but you know me. That's how we got the team's foot in the door. Matt and or my mentor are going to be here sitting co-pilot this entire transaction. This is how much business we've done in the past year. Are you confident to work with us? Of course, this sounds amazing. Well, after a year of that constant shadowing and mentoring, or even maybe helping get somebody to close the deal, they've now gotten the experience of what I think is five years in the business. And after that one year, they'll have a much better idea of, can I make a sustainable living here? Can I quit my full-time job that I don't love? And can I now be able to do it? So I think it's I think it's threefold. One is the training, two it's the mentoring, and three, at the end of the day, we gotta close houses to get paid. Can we help them close more houses? And the answer is, if they get us the lead, we help them close it. The marketing may have helped them get the lead, but on the back end, all the support, they don't have to write their own contracts. They don't have to come up with their own marketing plan. And if someone buys in and truly plugs into the system, you know, my hope is that they go from a $2 million agent to a $10 million agent 
to a $20 million agent. And two of the teammates who started with me four and five years ago will both do over 20 million this year. One was a nurse, one was a sign language interpreter. We have three or four more people right on their heels. And I'm finding that by year five in our system, people can become a 15 to $25 million producer with life-changing income. So that's what drives me. And that's what my passion is at this point. It's like, if I can get 10 or 20 people to 25 million, I'll be pumped. <laughs> I love that. That's awesome. Tina, how about you? What are you able to offer? Well, um, I'm able to offer that same level of customer uh, service that I would give the clients, you know, the whole experience, things like that. Uh, I almost feel like a broken record because I repeat this so much. But at the end of the day, um, you know, I'm providing them with such a level of service that keeps them coming back and also uh, has driven my business to be a lot of referrals. I mean, the majority of my business now is what I envisioned it, which was based off of referrals. Like I've got some clients that can't keep my name out of their mouth. They're just like, you know, I think you should invest in Hawaii's real estate market. And if you want to learn more information, you can go sit down with Tina. I tell them, Hey, it's nothing, you know, formal that you have to sit down with. I'm not going to have you sign anything. I'm just here to help educate. And then if you choose to purchase a home here. I hope you choose my team. So, um, you know, providing that, you know, that time and customer service, uh, why, you know, I can be sitting at the office, which I'm probably at the office a lot because I'm meeting with clients. So maybe Sarah is out doing showings and that's a client that I sat down with to do an initial consultation. And then after the showing, they'll come and meet me at the office and we'll grew, regroup and we'll chat about, Hey, these are what the comps are looking like. Um, and I'm able to get so much work done and schedule new consoles while she's out at the showings, but then it ties me back into the clients when they come back and they sit at my office and discuss how their showings went and everything with me versus me spending that time to be driving around to each showing, maybe waiting in these open house lines, things like that. So it's, it's the opportunity that it provides me to give a better level of customer service. Don't feel like a broken record. I think it's uh, a lot of these questions <clears throat> somewhat overlap each other, but I think it really comes down to even sometimes just thinking about that value proposition. When you are meeting with a potential buyer or seller, what does that conversation look like? How are you setting yourself apart from the competitor who may be a solo agent? So Shannon, I'm going to kind of move over to you because your value proposition probably did change slightly as you went from being solo by yourself and bringing your husband into the team. So do you share that with your clients when you're meeting with them? And what does that conversation look like? Yes. And um, like I said, we, we try, if at all possible, if we're both available, that we both meet on Zoom to do our initial Zoom conference. Um, I redid my listing presentation to include both of us in there. And, you know, like I said, my goal is to get Tyler to the point where he can take that listing presentation on his own and run with it. Um, but beforehand it was about me, you know, being the listing person. And now it's like, we're a team. And, um, I highlight a little bit about his background and what he brings, like how his skill set as an engineer stuff, what he brings to the table, my background as a teacher, what, what skills that brings to the table and just let them know that you're getting two agents for one, basically like you, you've got the team of us. Um, this last year, we actually did well enough at the end of the year, we bought our a little investment property ourselves, we invested in some land further out in the hill country. And so I think that also, you know, adds another layer of expertise, because we have a lot of people investing and it's like, oh, yeah, we just bought property over here ourselves. And so the more you're involved in the business, the more stories you can share, and we try to just again, share stories more than um, stats about ourselves. It's like, yes, we do have a map of here's everything we've sold and stuff, but I think people relate to other people's stories. So if someone's like, I want to list, but I'm really worried about where am I going to go? You know what? We just helped a, co a couple over here that did the same thing. And this is the solution. We did this, we did that. And this is how we got them to where they need to be. And just kind of that reassurance that we have solutions in place to help them navigate this tricky time because so many people would love to sell, but they don't know where they're going. So I think just being able to share more experiences of how we've helped others and, and again, just presenting ourselves as a solid team effort, it, it has definitely helped us um, 
uh, you know, build better rapport and build that trust with clients. Storytelling people love the yeah. stories and it, it also helps along those lines, as you say, bringing their comfort level up a little bit or maybe overcoming those objections. I know we all know that the old felt found strategy of overcoming those objections. And I think when you have those real life stories to put into place, it can be really beneficial. Okay, Matt, um, I think I know the answer to this question, but some of our folks might not. When you were starting out your team, what was that first role that you hired and why did you make the decision to fill that position? Uh, first position I hired was actually an assistant. So I started uh, in 2010. I, I, similar to Shannon's husband, left a full-time job with benefits to start a real estate career in the worst real estate market like ever. And people were like, you're crazy. And I probably was a uh, huge reduction, re uh, reduced pay year over year from 09 to 10. But then in 2011, it bounced back. And thanks to my wife's support, it was kind of onward from there. But to that 10 year business for the 15 year business plan I wrote, I said, as soon as I do this many million dollars, I'm hiring an assistant, no one's gonna stop me. So I hit that in my second year and I had an assistant at like 26 years old and everyone looked at me like I was absolutely nuts. And I said, you know why I hired an assistant? So that when I'm out in an appointment like this, somebody can call my office and someone will literally answer the phone and say, office of Matt Weibel. And what other 26 year old agent has someone answering their phone saying the office of Matt Weibel? And instantaneously, all of the older people that were in my SOI immediately were like, well, this guy's going places because he has a secretary. As all of you guys know, everyone on this chat, every, you know, my fellow panelists, like sometimes when you're brand new, it's that one big break. It's the fake it till you make it. Like you can have all the real estate knowledge in the world. You can have all the transactional knowledge in the world, but if you don't have clients, you don't have a business. So you have to get the client sometime first. It's like a chicken or an egg thing. And sometimes to get those clients, it's just the perception of like, hey, my family's been selling real estate in Sorin Park forever. That's awesome. But Matt, you're 25 years old. We're not going to hire you. But your secretary answered the phone. So I'll give you at least a shot at a listing appointment. Okay. Go in, crush the listing appointment, sign in the yard. Boom. Let's keep, let's keep the train rolling. And that's been, honest to goodness, the guiding light of my team building has been that whole idea of let's keep growing it until we can't and let's do it the right way with the right partners and everything kind of seems to fall in its place but Shannon I love that example of like the first person story because there's a huge difference when you're when you're brand new in the business and you got to rely on nothing but third person stories and when you say oh you know somebody on my team or somebody in my office told me a story about this the most terrified thing I had was like if somebody, I had all the third person stories memorized, but my biggest concern was what happens if someone asked me that next question, like beyond the surface level. I'm like, well, how did it end? Be like, oh, I have no idea. I, I wasn't involved. But when you have those first person stories or you're involved in more transactions, that's what does put people's mind at ease. Like, I know it sounds crazy to make an offer right now without inspections but I've had three buyers that got under contract last month. All three of them brought their inspector to the actual appointment. And we were doing a home inspection while we were seeing the home. And I told the guy who's a good friend of mine and a client, I said, dude, you gotta be on turbo mode, like high level stuff first down to like, don't really care about it. But we were able to make an offer, no inspections because we've already done it. Well, I said that to somebody over the weekend, they looked at me like I had two additional heads and they're like, I'm not doing this. And then they just lost out today. And you know what? I just got a text message while we were on this that he's like, we're bringing the inspector to the next showing. I said, perfect. So sometimes it is that first person story of someone else is as crazy as me <laughs> that makes it, that makes them feel good. We lost Lisa. Do you want to throw a question at us, Katie, or should we <laughs> come up with others? I don't have a list of questions. Um, 
I have a question for the panel. Okay. okay. What is your, what's your most influential book? What's a book that you're like, every single person on here today should go out and buy? I'm in the, I just started reading um, Never Split the Difference and I'm kind of hooked on that. So I, I love that. On my list, yeah. required team reading. It's amazing. That's good. So for those of you who don't know, Chris Voss, who's the author of that book, um, was a retired FBI like hostage negotiator. And he also teaches a master class for anybody that has a master class subscription. And that is awesome, even after you've read the book. Um, but I did it through Audible, and the guy who read the book was really good. But basically, he went to Harvard on like a, a joint program between the FBI and Harvard Business. And even though he self-proclaimed the dumbest person in the classroom, ended up getting not only the best grade, but making the professor remake the course. And they are now like business partners and have started creating this like negotiation tactics. So if, if anybody feels like negotiation is a weak point or they just want to get a leg up on their competition, Shannon is, that's actually on my list. I actually typed in the, in the chat. Awesome. How about you, Tina? So I already mentioned The Go-Giver. I really like that book a lot. Um, but a book that's great for, I mean, in this industry, we're entrepreneurs. Um, and so I really like the book called You Are a Badass yeah. by Jenny Farrell. So that's a really good book um, that I think just kind of boosts that inner confidence that, you know what, like, I may not, like for a new agent, you know, hey, you could say I may not get this listing uh, going to the appointment, but you know what, I'm just going to try. You just have to have this just try mentality to get out there and just put yourself out there and give it your best foot forward. And if it works, it works. And if it doesn't, it's okay. Just wait for the next opportunity and try again. So I put a couple of mine. I just wrote that down. I'm going to get the go-giver this afternoon. Uh, a couple of other ones I mentioned to Connie, who put it in the chat earlier. Um, Dig your well before you're thirsty. It was written uh, a, a little while ago but it's all about networking. And I'll mention that book several times um, tomorrow in the SOI class, but it is unbelievable, the power of each of our networks. And I'm so amazed at how many people that are realtors spend all of this time trying to get complete strangers to pay attention to them when they won't even take the 10 minutes to make a phone call to a friend. And it's just amazing. The amount of money you have to spend to get a complete stranger to trust you is a probably marketing budget beyond any of our capabilities. But the ability to host one event and even now virtual events, I'm doing a virtual coffee tasting uh, with the local coffee shop and they're teaching us how to use a pour over filter. Um, that was an idea I got from, from that book. So it, that's pretty good. And then the other ones, it's a two part series um, it's chop wood, carry water and pound the stone. Um, chop wood, carry water is the first book. It's like an afternoon read. It's, it's not, there's nothing really profound about it. There's some good ideas, but I find that that's a great intro to pound the stone and everyone on my team has to read dig your well before you're thirsty, never split the difference, which Shannon also mentioned. Um, and then that chop wood, carry water, pound the stone. And it, as you both build your team or anyone here builds your team, if you want to find out who good teammates are, don't ask them to tell you how great they are. Have them show you. Here's your, we have an onboarding process that it is intimidating. But if, if you want to be a part of the family, show me that you're worth a, insert your favorite word. Um, and when people do, and the people that have bought in, they crush it. The people that don't buy in, million excuses and you know it's probably my fault that I never sold real estate so to to me that was the one thing that i learned from all these books is that there's so many ideas out there there's so many smart people don't reinvent the wheel take all the cool stuff that you learn and make it your own i'm hey, it's jo hey lisa <laughs> hey it's joe mangum hey everybody 
Uh, first off, I just, I'm so, I find this so amazing. I'm getting texts from Lisa going, I've been knocked off and can't get on. And so I'm trying to jump in and y'all just taking it. I just love that. That's what I love about our ages. Y'all just said, okay, she's gone. We'll keep going. <laughs> yes, you guys, thank you so much. And what <laughs> happened is it, then it also cleared out my chat box. So to our audience, I know we have about 10 minutes left. So if there's, I have a couple more questions I want to ask our, our, our panelists. But if you have any questions, please go ahead and put those up there so that we can make sure to address them. Um, so... So Rachel, really quick, she just put her question here in the chat box and it says, once I've built a team here in Las Vegas, I would like to add other cities. How would I go about that? At least first steps, please. So anybody have something that they want to share with her, with Rachel? So for me, I mentioned a little bit, um, I think just privately with us uh, and I'm not sure if with everybody on here, uh, I don't have a team built anywhere else, and I'm not sure about either of you, Matt, you may with such a large team of, you know, spread out with diversity. Um, but for us, Oahu is only so big, right? So at the end of the day, when we had a client that really was interested in some Maui properties, which is a flight over, um, we combined forces with Century 21 Island Homes on Maui. And I don't think it's necessarily us building one big team together, but learning how to work uh, with another team and coming up with a great end goal and then learning along the way. Because then, you know, we could also help them with the Wahoo's market while they continue to help us with Maui's market, things like that. So I think it'd be hard to be in, you know, two places. One, like two different cities. I'm not sure if it's like cities outside of Vegas that you're talking about, Rachel, or like Vegas and, you know, like three hours away. I'm not too sure. And I'm wondering, um, Matt, as your team has grown, are you actively recruiting? Are you looking at areas, you know, sometimes even if we look at our golden ruler report, right? That golden ruler report tells us where our online inquiries are coming from. So do we look to those areas to grow our business? So maybe Rachel's starting to get a lot of inquiries or opportunities in those surrounding areas. Do you recruit? How do you look to those areas to maybe find talent with somebody who is currently living in those areas to add to your team? Correct. So I don't even know if I mentioned it earlier, but we, so we cover 14 Maryland counties plus Baltimore city, but like four of those counties, we, it's a blanket. Like if you look at our sales, whenever I'm at a listing appointment or working with a buyer, I actually pull up like our home snap map and it shows all of our transactions over the two years. Like you can't even see the County. So you want to talk about like warm and fuzzy, like we got you covered literally. Um, as I continue to grow, there is a real conversation that you have to have internally with your teammates, which is, can we support somebody that's an hour, hour and a half away, as well as we do that somebody's 20 or 30 minutes away. And for me, Maryland counties aren't that large. So to give you all context, like our footprint is 90 minutes in any direction to the outer reaches. Our every day is like 20, 20 minutes, 30 minutes in every direction. But Maryland's a pretty concentrated state. So in that 30 minute, diam 30 minute diameter, we have Washington DC, Baltimore, Annapolis, Fort Meade, the Eastern Shore. So if you pull up like Google Maps, there's a lot of places where people work. So to me, I would say, first and foremost, you gotta start looking at how many lost opportunities you're having. And the first step for me would be an unofficial like blanket agreement with an agent that does good work out there that you vet, interview, have lunch, have dinner and say, hey, do you want to be my, for me right now, my Northern Virginia arm of the team? You're not a part of the team, but I'll introduce you as like, you're our go-to agent here. The best example I have is Ocean City, Maryland. And my family's got a place down there. We're down there all the time. Could I sell there? It's still Maryland? Absolutely. Do I choose to? No. You know why? Because when I go down there, I don't want to do work. And the, the, the real reason is I can learn the market, but I won't be an expert. And the person who does my referrals down there is literally like the mayor <laughs> of Ocean City. 
and he walks up and down the street and people are waving at him like people like jokingly wave at me here in my hometown. I've known them since I was a little kid. So he knows them. That's an easy, no brainer decision. Anybody that says, hey, Matt, who's your go to in Ocean City? Done. I make my 25 percent. See you later. Bye. They're happy. They tell the next person and onward we go. We have a relationship where even if someone goes directly to him, but it's from my SOI and vice versa, if someone comes to me over here, that's the best way from a partnership. If you try to do a true expansion, it's going to include a local admin and it's going to, it's going to need local office space. So those are two expenses right out of the gate that that book of business better support both of those things. Because if you try to say, I serve Las Vegas and here's my home base and look at my awesome office here. And then, oh yeah, I also support this county that's 30, 45 minutes away, but there's no signage. There's no place to do a settlement. There's no place to do an in-person buyer meeting. They're going to quickly realize that you're a town over trying to come in and take business. The cool thing like with our brokerage is we have all of these offices and all these different places that we're already doing. So even if it's not our home base, we still have a place to do a settlement that's not an hour and a half away um, and stuff like that. But to, to me, I think as you build it and expand out, everybody wants to chase that, that deal, that extra deal. But to Lisa's point, if you can find somebody who's maybe jonesing for something that you can't offer, or they can't offer themselves, i.e. if I found somebody right now that's already doing five to 10 million in an area, but they have no admin support, no one to write offers, no one to sit open houses and things of that nature, I could offer to them, we have that ability, but we're gonna need to immediately recruit two other agents to help you. But I will take all the back end of your business off of your plate for that partnership. You will get every referral from the rest of the team coming to you directly. You choose what you wanna do and manage it. And I think that would be an opportunity to grow quickly in a new marketplace. Great. And you, um, we have about four minutes left in our session and then I'm going to be, and hopefully you guys will all be following me over to our afternoon session with uh, Cabot Brown, but in 60 seconds, you guys, um, each of you, if somebody here in the audience is where you were, where you currently are and thinking about doing something with developing a team. Um, what advice would you give them to motivate them, to reassure them that they are potentially making the decision and just going for it? So let's go ahead and start with you, Shannon. Um, like I said, I, just be prepared, know your numbers of, you know, what is it going to cost you to have both? <laughs> like I said, if you're a marriage mate, like this is your income. So don't just blindly jump into being a CEO of a business when you haven't calculated it. Um, and then the main thing is just keep a positive mindset and, and just stay positive because there's so much negativity on Facebook from other agents and everything about how hard the market is. So just focus on developing your skills and be persistent and just stay positive and you'll do well if you, if you just keep at it. Love it. And Tina? Well, my advice is simple. Have an amazing mentor. Um, my mentor is Aaron Evans, who's the broker owner of Century 21 Island Homes. And I would say at the end of the day, uh, I mean, my numbers proved that by having a mentor, I was able to skyrocket in performance. So I would say if you're in possibly any of our shoes and you're looking to grow or build a team, I would say have somebody that's maybe experienced in that role and somebody that you can call for any kind of questions along the way, because there's going to be so many questions you're going to have and you're going to want somebody that's been there and done that and is encouraging along the way too. For me, I really feed well off encouragement. So Erin's really great. She'll send me, you know, positive messages via text, uh, you know, quotes, different things like that. And, you know, spice it up with, uh, you know, competitions at the office, things like that. So having a great mentor is really key. Great. I love that. I think you're absolutely right. And Matt, what are your final words for us today? Find people who are open to doing things the way that you want to do things. And I know that sounds pretty straightforward, but you'd be amazed at how many people only want to take from a team relationship. There's no give back, right? I joined this team to get, 
and they start listing off the things that they want to get out of joining the team. I ask every single person when I interview them, what are you bringing to me that I don't already have? I mean, we're crushing it. We're doing 200 plus units. You have a family. How are you going to come in and be a good member of this family? And it's, it stumps people sometimes. And, and, and it's okay to not have an answer right out of the gate, but you don't have to have 25 agents. You don't have to do 200 units a year to ask that question as you're building your team whether it's the third member for Shannon, the fifth member for Tina, like I encourage you to be pretty intense on the onboarding and, and be pretty intense on the, on the interview. I wasn't when I was in either of your position and, and we had some, some bad eggs and it didn't always work out, but learn from those mistakes and take that extra time. Right now it's, it's three interviews to join this team. One, one with the person who brings them on and our VP one with me and two other members of our exec committee and a third in person, even during COVID, if we had to be sitting 12 feet apart, I don't care. I have to see in person and we're going to read you and we're going to ask questions and there's homework assignments after each one. And the person that comes into that and start asking, what are you going to do for me? I'll be like, could potentially change your life and you could make life altering money in about three or four years. So I don't have that much time. I'm not the team for you. People who are desperate for money make desperate mistakes. And that desperate mistake could bring down the whole team of what we've built. And for me, I'd rather go with somebody who's less experienced, but more hungry than someone who's set in their ways and be like, well, I've done this for 10 years and I know what I'm doing. You sure do. Congratulations. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I hope we co-op together. But my, my advice to everybody who's thinking about building a team, read every book you possibly can on building a team, but don't buy in to any single mindset. Take what you like out of each of those books and make it your own because each of those people who wrote the book did it for themselves in their own place at their own time. The market's changed drastically in the past 18 months. To build a team that was good for 2000 is not going to work in 2021. Um, even a team built five years ago has had to change drastically over the last six years, you know, five or six years. So I think be fluid, be open and make sure first and foremost that you get good, good people who are honest and uh, appreciative of your time. I think everybody thinks that team leaders get rich off the team business and that's not the case. It's, it's about the customer. Great words to end on. I just want to Thank each and every one of you for your time today. You are all so very busy and you brought so much insight, I think, to our audience today. Matt has so much more to say for everyone um, who can join him in when uh, tomorrow's session. Um, please make sure you go and register for that. Again, if not, it will be recorded, but um, he's provided some great information for those larger teams today. Tina and Shannon, thank you so much. And I really hope that you all will join me in our next session coming up here in about 30 minutes with Cabot Brown. You know, right now we are all suffering from a huge shortage in inventory and Cabot's going to share with us his knowledge and expertise on how we can really leverage those current listings that we have to take on some additional business from each and every listing. But again, have a great have a rest of your day, everyone. And I look forward to hopefully someday getting to meet you all in person. Thank you so much. Thank you. Everybody have a great week. Hello. Bye. <laughs>